Bertie's wife, Princess Alexandra, had long since learned to turn a blind eye to her husband's stable of mistresses. But in the Countess of Warwick, she had come up against a real rival. Daisy Warwick was unlike the professional beauties and the sort of slightly marginal society ladies. Daisy Warwick was right in the middle of the court, a court insider. She was a mistress with whom Alex couldn't cope because she threatened Alex's whole sort of world. Alexander becomes increasingly distant and she punishes Bertie by going abroad and by staying abroad. She goes and stays with her family and she cables back sort of laconically, I'm so sorry, um, uh, you know, have got delayed. Doesn't show any indication of coming back. This was public humiliation for Bertie. Bertie had brought his relationship with the princess to breaking point. Alexandra needn't have worried. The prince's prodigious energies had begun to fail him in one crucial area. We know that Bertie's health was poor at the time of his relationship with Daisy Warwick. And it's also true that in his diary, um, uh, Bertie does um, talk um, about um, electrical treatment. Now, what could this be? One of the things that a male patient might have visited a doctor to be cured for was impotence problems, because it was thought that electricity, a shock of electricity, could restore the body's sort of vital energy. For Daisy, I think the physical side of their relationship was hugely important. I think that she loved sex. She was uh, always worrying about it um, and wanting to meet people. Um, I found a draft of her letters that said that she mated naturally with physical strength or beauty. Beauty had never been an attribute Bertie could lay claim to. Now his strength was in question. In 1898, the still highly charged Countess fell pregnant by another man. To Alexandra's delight, Daisy wrote to the Prince, ending the ten-year affair. Her letter is long since destroyed, but Bertie's reply is on record. My lovely little Daisy, you could not help my loved one writing to me as you did, though it gave me a pang. I gave your letter to the princess. She was moved to tears and said that out of evil, good would come. The Prince of Wales once again faced an empty existence. But all that was about to end. The Queen's health was failing. In January 1901, Bertie was summoned to Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. For the first time in his life, he entered his mother's bedroom. When she saw Bertie, her eldest son, in whom for a great deal of her life she had not been best pleased, I don't think he expected to receive quite the warmth that some of his siblings got. But she completely opened her arms to him by saying, Bertie and pulling him forward and hugging him. And he was reduced to tears. The reconciliation had come too late. Minutes later, his mother lapsed into unconsciousness and died. The moment Bertie had been waiting for all his life had arrived. The accession of an overweight 59-year-old philanderer hardly thrilled the public imagination. Few sovereigns have come to the throne with lower expectations. But from his first command as king, Bertie was determined to send a signal of intent to his doubters. He must have recognized that his sense of insecurity was also reflected by the whole nation's and empire's view that he was simply not quite up to the job as she, his mother, had been. And when he went down to join the yachts that were lined up to take Queen Victoria's body back from the Isle of Wight to Portsmouth, he looked up in the rigging and saw that the Royal Standard was flying at half-mast, and he asked the captain why that was the case. And the captain, perplexed, said, well, the Queen is dead, and he said, no, the king is alive. 
And I think that that was a sort of florid way where, with the spectacular nature of using a symbol, he was able to show that, no, this show goes on. On the 21st of January, 1901, Bertie followed the late Queen's funeral cortege on its journey towards its final resting place at Windsor. But even as the King bade farewell to his mother, Bertie was determined to break with the traditions of her reign and forge his own distinctive brand of monarchy. After the death of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria had led an increasingly reclusive existence behind the walls of Windsor Castle and her forbidding Highland retreat, Balmoral. These 20 seconds of film footage showing Victoria taking a carriage ride at Balmoral are one of the rare glimpses into royal life the Queen was prepared to allow. There was a great and growing deal of concern about Victoria's withdrawal from public life. Obviously, her mourning was profound and everyone respected that, but when it went on and on and on and she didn't open Parliament, she didn't appear, it fed into a growing Republican move within Britain. There were these royals taking salaries and not doing the job. In the 1870s, Britain came closer to becoming a republic than at any time in the I would say 80s, 90s, or 20th centuries. I mean, the Queen had become extremely unpopular, and she was viewed as being a kind of selfish, extravagant figure, just sulking in her castle, doing nothing for the country. In stark contrast to his mother, the Prince of Wales couldn't have been more visible. Bertie's response to this criticism was basically to say that the monarch needs to be seen in public to go and open hospitals, to lay foundation stones, to cut tapes, uh, to launch ships, all of the things that members of the royal family do today. By doing these things, I think Bertie was conscious that he was fighting back, that this was a new role that the monarchy must perform. Installed in Buckingham Palace and free from his mother's apron strings, the new king threw himself into preparations for a dazzling coronation that would put the royal family back at the heart of national life. But Bertie's lack of experience in dealing with affairs of state soon began to tell. He was completely overwhelmed with all the things, all his projects, all the things that he wanted to do. The work itself was something completely new, all these boxes full of documents that he had no training of going through. He read everything. Um, he hadn't learnt how to delegate at all. All the sort of detail about, you know, even down to what tune the soldiers played outside his wind window at Windsor Castle. He had to decide everything. He is overwhelmed by all this responsibility. Dangerously overweight and chain-smoking cigars, the king appeared to be sinking beneath the burden of responsibility. Doctors began to fear for his health. I saw the king every morning in his bedroom at nine. I found him surrounded by letters, telegrams and papers which covered the whole bed. He was evidently greatly perturbed and drew attention to the litter around him with a gesture of despair. He begins to do things like eating far too much. Um, I mean, he'd always eaten far too much, but to eat sort of, in a sort of, sort of bulimic way, sort of stuff. Alexandra complained that at meals he just stuffed. He never sort of chewed. He just stuffed himself with food. So he does seem at the beginning to be going through a kind of mental crisis. The king's mental crisis was about to trigger a national drama. A few days before the coronation ceremony, the king collapsed with abdominal pains. Doctors diagnosed acute appendicitis, a potentially fatal condition at the turn of the 20th century. The top doctors are called in to deal with it. It's a guy called Frederick Treves, the man who, uh, who looked after the elephant man at the, uh, at the hospital in Whitechapel. Here, called in to deal with another sort of uh, 19th century monster, Bertie who is lumbering around in pain 
in this sort of dyspeptic agony. You know, this organ is swelling inside him and demanding attention and causing him the most exquisite pain. The royal surgeon insisted that the coronation be delayed. The king raged. The coronation cannot be postponed. I cannot and will not disappoint the people. I will go to the abbey at any cost. I will go to the abbey if I die there. Being crowned, having the holy oil poured on him, this was an enormously important event for him. The thing that he had been waiting for all his life, much as Prince Charles has been waiting for his mother to depart this life so that he can become king. This was the purpose in life. And so when he got ill uh, and the coronation, uh, all the plans had been made, all the invitations had been sent, all the, all the china had been produced, um, the dishcloths, everything had been ready, and uh, he got ill. And so he was determined to try and keep it up. The assumption of power after having waited for so long is incredibly important to him. But Treves presents him with an ultimatum. He says, if you don't postpone the coronation, you will be going to Westminster Abbey in a box. Finally, the king gave way. At noon on the 24th of June, he climbed onto an operating table in Buckingham Palace and submitted to the surgeon's knife. The flags are all up. It's all been paid for. And everybody is made to wait while the king undergoes this very difficult and dangerous operation. You know, a lot of people died of appendicitis in this period. This is a new procedure. And it doesn't go well. The king stops breathing. The king turns blue in the face. And you can imagine the whole empire holding its breath at this moment, because this man has been waiting for decades to be the king of this country. And it looks as if he's not going to get his chance to prove what he's capable of doing. The doctors did their job. Bertie would go to the Abbey, not in a box, but the golden state coach of his ancestor, King George III. On the 9th of August, 1902, the one-time prodigal prince was crowned King Edward VII in a dazzling display of pomp and pageantry. Edward VII expected the ceremony to be delivered absolutely perfectly. He watched every detail of it with care and concern. He wanted to send a message to the whole empire that they had a new emperor with all the panoply he could muster. And he looked into the great dressing up box of British history and he opened all the files and papers going back in time to conjure a coronation of fabulous splendor in order to deliver utter impact. Bertie was very much ahead of his time as monarch because he was one of the first to understand that if the monarchy was to survive um, in the 20th century, it must be ornamental. It must be something that people could identify with, that they could see. He is becoming the kind of monarch that England needed in the 20th century. Almost overnight, Edward VII transformed the public face of the monarchy. Now he set about sweeping away the physical evidence of Queen Victoria's reign. Determined to bring light into his mother's fusty apartments, he hired technicians to install electric lights and theatre designers to transform Buckingham Palace into a sea of white and gold. Bertie embarks on a full-scale clear-out. He marches around pictures of Albert, pictures of her dogs, all of it is swept aside. All the old clutter that Victoria had accumulated is swept aside and the place is made into a palace. This was a statement about what he thought um, the monarchy should be. That it must be grandly, some people would say slightly vulgarly, but it must be grand and it must give a sense of theatre. Edward VII realised that on its own, the restoration of traditional ceremonial wasn't enough to preserve the monarchy. In 
in an era of rapid social change, Bertie believed the crown should move with the times. Edward VII was very much aware that the monarchy needed to reach out beyond the sort of aristocracy to other classes. In a way, he is the first democratic king. He didn't judge people on the basis of your position in Burke's peerage. He was somebody who invited people, you know, Americans, Jews, people like that who might not have been welcomed in the most blue-blooded circles. With trades unions and the labor movement on the march, the People's King even extended the hand of friendship to sworn enemies of the crown. He wants to be a symbol of unity. For example, there's a story about him meeting Keir Hardy, the Labour MP, who at the time was the absolute bete noire of you know, all royalty and all the aristocracy and the Tory party because he was highly critical of privilege and was very vociferous about saying so. And Edward VII meets Keir Hardy and he is extraordinarily charming and polite you know, to this class enemy. Uh, one of his friends, you know, looks at him and says rather sarcastically, well, you know, you were very nice to him. And Edward turns to him very quickly and very sharply and says, no, you don't understand. I mean to be, you know, king of all the people. To the surprise of many of his contemporaries, Edward VII was proving himself a more than capable monarch. But much as he relished his new public responsibilities, the king saw no reason to change the private habits of a lifetime. Even at the sacred moment of his coronation, the king signaled his intent with his unconventional choice of guests. Pride of place in the abbey was given to a special box for his lady friends, past and present, including new mistress Alice Keppel. He made sure that all the women who were important to him, some of whom he slept with, were close at hand at this prime moment of his life. He made sure that those women, uh, without trying to put out his wife in any way, were accorded a position around him whenever he could provide that, and no less so than at the coronation. Edward VII was made like that. He loved his queen, he adored his children, but he just needed a little bit of extra. Edward VII worked out for himself a new style of monarchy, which basically involved a lot of public appearances, doing the public job, the ceremonial job, perfectly. And yet, at the same time, um, he drew a very, very strict line between that and his private life. I think that he had this very realistic idea, in a way much more realistic than putting the whole royal family on show, of saying, look, I'm king, I will do my job as king, but um, the deal is that I am allowed a private life. For the rest of his life, the king continued to enjoy all the luxuries of his position, with Mrs Keppel never far from his side. Queen Alexandra had little choice but to put up with her husband's behaviour, but nobody else seemed to mind much. And in 1903, the king's passion for beautiful women would even prove the key to his greatest political triumph. In the early years of the 20th century, one issue dominated British foreign policy over all others. Germany, under the king's troublesome nephew Kaiser Wilhelm, was building up its armed forces at terrifying speed. As Prince of Wales, Bertie had been blocked in his ambition to influence foreign and military affairs. Now he was determined to put his inside family knowledge to good use. The Kaiser is a very difficult man and very paranoid. Bertie understood that in a kind of intuitive way. Bertie understood very clearly that it was not going to be possible for him to restrain Germany or anybody to restrain Germany. And he also understood that the Kaiser was never going to be um, a reliable friend. So he saw, and saw incredibly clearly, uh, that um, war was a real danger. He didn't want war, uh, but he felt that if war was going to come, Britain must be prepared. Britain needed allies. Finding them wasn't going to be easy. 
The recent war in South Africa against the Boers had made Britain highly unpopular in Europe. But the king had a plan. In May 1903, he set out on a mission of diplomacy to one of the favorite haunts of his youth, Paris. Bertie didn't tell them his plans. He makes this completely secret um, uh, agenda. He didn't even tell his, um, his, his secretaries. And when the royal train arrives and Bertie gets out to the station, he's met with incredibly hostile French crowds. Bertie turns up in Paris, uh, a place where the British are incredibly unpopular at the time, and when he arrives, he is booed. Uh, there are newspaper editorials saying, go back to England, and basically listing every English insult since, you know, the burning of Joan of Arc. Faced with a French mob, the English king's love of Parisian culture and women was about to pay dividends. He goes to the theatre, and the audience in the theatre is incredibly sort of um, unfriendly and sullen. And to the dismay of the French police, the king insists during the sort of interval of going into the foyer and he spots an actress and he goes up to her and um, kisses her hand and says, um, Mademoiselle, uh, when I last saw you in London, you were superb. Edward really does have a sort of magic touch. Immediately, the kind of rumor mill in Paris puts this about, he'd been incredibly charming to this famous actress. You know, the next day, he sort of walks out into the crowds, he shakes hands, he says how he loves Paris, he looks happy. He charms the pants off the French. Uh, the mood changes like this, you know, it just flips. Suddenly, there's an outburst of cheering wherever he goes. There's a sort of, a, a, a real sense that he is one of them. Do you need to remember that um, no English politician spoke French like that? None of them knew Paris like that. And that is critically important in causing a, a huge change in French opinion. The king's weakness for French wine, women and song had helped him pave the way for a crucial strategic alliance with the old enemy. There's a sort of French love of an English milord. I mean, milord, of course, is what they called, you know, English upper class aristocrats who came to Paris to have a good time. And as Prince of Wales, Edward VII, had come a lot in the 80s and 60s and 70s and was famous for his, you know, a great enjoyment of the theater and also his use of, you know, French brothels. And I'm sure that milord uh, reputation didn't do him any harm when he came back in 1903 as king. Next, Bertie threw his support behind admirals arguing for a new generation of warships, the dreadnoughts, to keep pace with the German naval threat. The king was, if anything, ahead of his ministers in realising how vitally important it was that the British Navy must at all costs be built up. And I think that the king made a very serious contribution in pressing his ministers to build new, better ships, to look to the future. It was a future the 69-year-old king would not live to see. The 12 course dinners and the trademark cigars were catching up with him. Already seriously ill with chronic emphysema, in 1910 the king suffered a series of heart attacks. As he slipped in and out of consciousness at Buckingham Palace, he was joined by two women, his long-suffering wife, Queen Alexandra, and his mistress, Alice Keppel. He died just before midnight on the 10th of May, 1910. Alexandra remained devoted to Bertie, very close to him, throughout his life. After Bertie's death, the undertakers were always sort of making appointments to come and put the body into a coffin. And it was always sort of announced in the Times that this was going to happen. And day after day, Alexandra would say, no, I can't bear to part with him. And um, people who came um, said that, you know, she was like, this was for the first time she had Bertie to herself. For eight days, the Queen clung to her husband. 
But even in death, Bertie was a people's king. In recognition of his unique popularity, it was decided that his body would lie in state at Westminster for the public to pay its respects. The first British monarch ever to do so. I think only when King Edward VII died did the British people realize how much they liked having him around. He'd been around for so long, and then suddenly he'd gone. And so they surged out in their hundreds of thousands to show they mourned his passing. Cues of people, humble people, poor people, um, they snaked around Westminster something like seven mile queues. This really does show, to a much greater extent than when Queen Victoria died, um, just how successful um, he had been in making this kind of connection between the monarchy and the people. He is this sort of libertine figure. He does seem like a fragment of, a, of an earlier age. You can imagine him kind of careering about 18th century London with a big wig on and a beauty spot. And I think, in a way, although he seems to be the absolute opposite of his father, he also seems like the right man for the job in the early part of the 20th century. Edward VII's creation of a modern public monarchy, together with his fast-living lifestyle, earned him the affection of his people and raised the royal family to new levels of popularity. His vision of monarchy as a showy theatre of pageantry continues to this day. But the example the king set in his personal life would be rejected. Bertie's descendants would attempt, with mixed results, to return to the family values of his mother, Queen Victoria. <laughs> 